Well, good morning from St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I'm the vicar here, and it is my delight to, those, to welcome those of you who are, wa who are here in person and those of you who are watching on the live stream to the forum where each week we explore important issues at the intersection of faith and the modern world. Um, it is the third Sunday of Easter, and it may seem like a strange day on which to contemplate our own deaths, but actually, if you think about it, the season of resurrection is the uh, disciples of Jesus processing the death and then what happens after the death of their Savior. So in some ways, it's just about as an appropriate time as ever um, to be thinking about what's going to happen when we die and planning ahead for that inevitability. As much as we try to escape it, as much as we try to think we're invincible, it will come. And we're very honored to have with us as our guest for today, uh, Amy Cunningham, who is the owner of Future fitting tribute funeral services um, and uh, she is going to help walk us through um, the changing nature of the funeral industry and uh, and share her experiences as someone who guides folks through making these decisions and then guides families um, through the aftermath of losing a loved one. Um, Amy, it is a real honor to have you here and Thank we're you, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I'm very excited to be here. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone online. Um, as a funeral director, I meet families every day confused about their options. So I hope to bring comfort to you and a lot of information. Uh, I, prior to becoming a funeral director, prior to my mortuary school training in my mid-50s, I uh, was a magazine journalist, so I have a 30-year career as a writer. Uh, I wrote for the Washington Post Sunday Magazine. I wrote for all the women's magazines like Glamour and Mademoiselle in the old days when there were magazines like that, Lear's. So many of them have gone out of business, McCall's. Uh, and um, so I uh, got interested, as I'm going to explain to you, in uh, the funeral as a ministry, as an opportunity, when uh, my father died in South Carolina and I, I met his funeral director and had a very positive experience down in South Carolina, as I'll explain. But I come to the funeral uh, late in life, uh, very passionate about it, but my sensibility is that of a journalist. so. Um, I like to explain things to people and teach the funeral because there's so much confusion and COVID-19 and the crisis we've just weathered has only confused folks more about what is possible. So with that, um, we don't like to think about death, but our lives are enriched by its con con contemplating it and living in a way uh, where we know the, where we're headed and what the, have an ending in mind. Stephen Covey, who wrote The Seven Healthy Habits of uh, Successful People, uh, strongly feels that you have to have a notion of, of your ending as well as your beginning. So um, my father, uh, died at the age of 94 in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I was living with my husband and two children in Brooklyn at the time, going back and forth uh, to South Carolina to help supervise his hospice care. He was a Presbyterian. My mother and father, uh, she had died seven years earlier. He wanted a simple cremation and a large memorial event, which is what we gave him. But because he was friends with his funeral director, in towns like Orangeburg, people are socializing with their funeral directors um, through Rotary, Chamber of Commerce. So there's a, a camaraderie there in smaller towns that you may be familiar with uh, that we've lost a bit in the big city. Um, so I... Uh, used to think of how helpful it would be to have a button that says, have you hugged a funeral director today? Because we don't socialize uh, with funeral directors. And if there's one thing I want to leave you with today, it's that um, there's some really interesting people in funeral service. And in larger, larger numbers of women are coming into the industry. It's not just gentlemen in black trench coats anymore. There are a lot of very passionate um, uh, people of all sorts uh, 
in the business. But because my dad knew his funeral director and because he had a basic plan in place prior to his demise, we as a family, my sister, brother, and I, um, enhanced dad's uh, service, made it even more musical, more marvelous, and it was a big success. I came back to Brooklyn as a magazine writer, in that moment, my kids were in high school, I turned to my husband and I said, my God, I can't believe that dad is dead. I'm so distressed about it, but we really aced that memorial event. I'm so proud of what we did. We had a Dixieland uh, dirge going out the door of the Presbyterian Church and then they burst into sweet Georgia Brown in the sunlight of the open door. It was a healing experience between my family and the town. People were saying, my God, this is your last, the last gift of your father that he has left us. So I said to my husband, I was writing about Buddhism, meditation, yoga, um, spiritual experience. My husband's Jewish. We had a mixed faith family. So I said, I think I would like to help families with funerals. I didn't know anything about it. So six months later, at the age of 55, I was enrolled in mortuary school. Who knew that at 11th Avenue and 56th Street, there's a, a very nice mortuary school that's nationally known and, and uh, very good. And it was a very rigorous year. Then I had a funeral home residency. But it was this gentleman, the idea of this sweet guy down in South Carolina who ushered us through the whole experience that um, saw, allowed me to see that um, knowing a funeral director is a very lovely thing. Um, funeral directors don't have the best reputation historically, as you will perhaps recall in the 60s, Jessica Mitford, uh, her runaway bestseller, The American Way of Death, uh, uh, alerted Americans to the fact that uh, at the time, uh, some funeral directors were there were no regulations. They were upselling funerals. Um, it's still a, a debated book in the funeral business. Some older funeral directors are still upset about it because they feel like they were misrepresented. Uh, and the funeral industry at the time, this is around 1963, as the book came out, they discovered that Jessica Mitford, as a British uh, young woman growing up in England, she was a card-carrying communist, which uh, was sort of an intellectual thing um, at, at, in her circle at the time. The American funeral industry attacked the book, saying, this hideous woman is advocating a less expensive, less expensive more affordable funeral and depriving us of our Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition of a proper burial. She criticized in the book the fact that um, casket salesmen uh, were uh, promising uh, luxurious mattresses and, and uh, caskets of metal and bronze that would um, uh, cease uh, the uh, uh, desecration of the body, uh, the corruption of the earth. There was this feeling that you had to protect the body from the soil. And uh, in the years following the book, um, Liberace, uh, she was a uh, she consulted on the film The Loved One based on the Evil and Wa book and they cast Liberace as a sleazy uh, salesperson in the funeral home. So it's out of that moment that um, cremation as an option for more Americans arose and as Jessica Mitford advocated a more affordable, uh, simpler kind of burial uh, or funeral rite, uh, Pope John Paul approved cremation and said that God is so powerful he can resurrect you from cremated remains. Uh, Reverend Billy Graham said uh, there is no barrier to resurrection. And before long, Ann Landers was writing columns giving uh, cremation etiquette advice because people were so flummoxed by how to manage a cremation. This has led, it took some time for families in the United States to adapt and get educated, but this has led to a transformation in the funeral industry. Every conference I go to for funeral directors is still about how to give people 
a beautiful funeral service uh, using cremation and how to uh, celebrate a life and uh, make cremation uh, something that families can um, practice uh, and feel good about. 2016 was the first year that the rate of cremation in this country surpassed the rate of burial. And that's expected to continue to climb and cremation is uh, thought to be um, going to be 78% of all funerals by 2040. New York City is a little more conservative than the rest of the country. Our rate of cremation right now is around 55%. Out west, California, Nevada, Colorado, the rate of cremation is already around 80%, 85%. So the consumer advocates following the Jessica Mitford um, message uh, began to talk up the direct cremation. The most frequent phone call a licensed funeral director receives is how much is your direct cremation? That's the first question that many people ask. This has led to a cremation uh, without any ceremony. It's the least expensive kind of funeral but, and here's where I sound like a, a funeral director, if you don't watch it, it can go by so quickly from this moment at the hospital or at the home, if the death occurs in the care of hospice, uh, your grandmother or grandfather dies in their own bed, in their own apartment, uh, people will come and transfer the deceased in a loving way out of the building and uh, documents are signed. Increasingly now with the coronavirus, documents are scanned and some people aren't even meeting with the funeral director to discuss everything. You, you sign things and send it back and the cremation occurs and a box is delivered um, to your home or you're asked to come to the funeral home to pick it up. Uh, sometimes you choose an urn and it's a little bit nicer than this, but I feel that there are ways that people uh, are missing uh, uh, opportunities to be with the physical body of their loved one, to add ceremony, prayer, ritual, time, slow it down, uh, and that's what I'm here to teach you today. The other thing about cremation is that it does create, as practiced today, even at the finest crematories, it does produce a kind of exhaust and requires a good bit of fossil fuel. So you may have read in the New York Times about ways uh, that are being contemplated and uh, approved out west, uh, natural organic recomposition, which is a composting of human remain, and also a water uh, fluid cremation, uh, getting popular legal in some 15 states now, to green up cremation because it, the methods really haven't changed since the 1800s and a lot of natural gas is, is used. So this cremation without ceremony, without um, uh, uh, ritual, has left a lot of people spinning from the death. And I meet with folks who are a little bit more secular sometimes, uh, I sit with the family, one person's Buddhist uh, or doing yoga, they're married to a Jewish person, um, and the family is religiously eclectic and intermarried, and they're really struggling to find ritual today. So how do we design a sustainable and more meaningful funeral experience is the question. And I don't need to tell you, but the first call and the great blessing you guys all share is your affiliation with this beautiful church, one of the finest places in New York City to get advice. So uh, if a loved one gets a dire diagnosis, enters hospice, if you yourself are anxious about health issues or just ready to get a plan in place, uh, the vicar and I have talked, and the first call should be here to set up a plan. And uh, there are books like The Five Wishes 
where you, um, do you stock that here, Vicar? They're guidebooks, they're guidebooks that in subsequent emails and conversations I'm going to help you find. Workbooks online uh, on Amazon.com where you can put everything from your passcodes to the websites you use um, and your um, uh, bequeath lists and your funeral plan all in one place. And they could be kept on file with a funeral director and the church. You also are blessed to have the columbaria, as we discussed. This is Walter Cronkite's funeral uh, right here at St. Bart's. You also have the most beautiful language in your funeral liturgy that, I, that is known. O oh God, whose mercies cannot be numbered, accept our prayers on behalf of thy servant and grant him an entrance into the light, the land of light and joy in the fellowship of thy saints through Jesus Christ, thy son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. The talk to have with family members re revolves around these topics. It is good to have a notion of how you want your physical body cared for. Do you want to be viewed? And sometimes you have to say to your family members, I don't know what I want um, if you need to view me again. Uh, sometimes when a death occurs, uh, your children are on the West Coast and they need to fly in. Sometimes it's very important to be in the presence of the body. A funeral home can arrange that, and um, I'm going to show you how you can spend time in the room. Uh, the, uh, another decision that I hope I help you with today is deciding, am I a cremation person, I, am I a burial person? Burial can be simplified. It doesn't need to be as complicated as it, as it was. Then something to think about is the venue for the gathering. Do you want a direct cremation and a large uh, church-based memorial event? Do you want your urn in church? Do you want uh, a, uh, a celebration of your life in a, in a restaurant or a, a outdoor setting? Your final resting place. We were talking about before we got started, scattering versus placing in a niche. Uh, there are a lot of options today. And uh, the management of your estate, obviously, is something you'll arrange with an attorney. I like it. I have a couple of um, friends who have put um, information about every painting, every print, every um, estate sale find, information on the backs of all the pictures so that when family members take them off the wall, they know exactly where everything came from, what you paid for it, and that's a very nice thing to do. My parents gave the three of us, uh, about 10 years before their deaths, um, they gave us legal pads and said, walk around the house and write down what's important to you. And to our astonishment, we all wanted different things. There were really no conflicts. So that was a nice experience and a very lovely way to kind of tune in to their energy, what mattered to us about the home and their belongings. And then the loving care of your legacy is something to really contemplate because Increasing numbers of people today want to spend less on the funeral so they have resources to give to um, charities and, and support important philanthropies. You can take your time at the bedside at the time of death. If you're fortunate enough to be, uh, uh, you know, there are many stresses to being a caretaker Hospice, uh, a death, a uh, prolonged death in the home can sometimes be exhausting. Uh, but when death finally arrives, it's a sacred moment for prayer. You can, um, in, during the coronavirus crisis, we were getting clergy on FaceTime to say prayers at bedsides where when we couldn't meet or gather, uh, the telephone became a very important tool. and. Uh, great part of the funeral because that moment at the bedside with the physical body 
is um, unlike any moment in time, and I, I'm, I'm speaking to you, and I think you've probably had your own experience at one point or another with this, with your own parents. Uh, I remember at my mother's death, just looking at her hand, the three of us took turns and spent 15 minutes each before the funeral directors arrived to make the transfer. We just sat listening to music in the presence of her body in the bed she died in, and I just remember staring at her hand and having an incredible moment studying each freckle, each wrinkle, imagining myself as a little girl holding that hand. So I encourage you, as, as painful it is, as it is, as much as we're tempted to walk away from the body, to take that gorgeous, gorgeous sacred time at the bedside. And hospitals will allow you two or three hours in the room if you ask for it. Believe it or not, I help New Yorkers uh, have funerals in the home. Uh, sometimes when death has occurred in an apartment or uh, a residence, this was a home funeral uh, out on the island where the family just wanted an overnight stay we brought, uh, actually the son made the casket in the garage out of pine, and uh, they just honored her overnight. They felt like they wanted to have candles and a ritual in the house. Uh, that's something that's legal, and uh, the body can be uh, kept in good condition with ice or just keeping the air conditioning on and keeping the room cool. Shrouding goes back a long way. Jesus Christ was shrouded in fabric. The ancient Egyptians used uh, wrappings and uh, believed that it was important to honor the body and wrap it. Just as we swaddle our infants, we can swaddle our dead. Even if it's a hospital death, you could um, gently uh, wrap your loved one in the sheet that they died in, if it's clean, or you can bring in gorgeous fabric, and a lot of people don't know that this is a possibility. So um, you can purchase shrouds online. There's a woman in Southern California. Um, the name of the website is King Karako, K-I-N-K-A-R-A-C-O. She sells burial couture, these gorgeous like sleeping bag garments that you can buy in advance and have in a trunk for yourself, for a loved one and um, they're about $625, but really a splendid way to wrap the body so that when the funeral director does arrive for the transfer, you can say, we bathed her face, we combed her hair, she's ready for you. So um, more and more baby boom families want to have experiences that, that are hands-on, um, uh, back to the 1800s, um, interaction with the dead. COVID has confused people, but as we get out of this hideous period, I hope to be able to go back to going into homes and helping families in those last hours before the transfer team takes the deceased person away. Uh, I use a lot of um, uh, rose petals, blossoms, even in hospitals. We take the uh, flowers off the windowsill. Inevitably, there are flowers in the room take those off the sill, put them in the deceased's hands. If you have the opportunity to do that kind of thing, do take advantage of it. Um, and you can sort of present these beautiful gifts to your loved one. Biodegradable caskets are very fashionable right now. They're uh, less expensive than the $6,000 caskets that were sold to us in other times. Uh, this willow basket has been pictured in the New Yorker, the New York Times. Uh, it's a biodegradable vessel. Uh, there's a woman in Vermont uh, weaving them by hand. And um, they go back to Victorian times when they were like a temporary house casket to keep the deceased in until a proper casket was made. But biodegradable caskets are, are perfectly dignified, and I'll show you some momentarily. Uh, this is the funeral of Jackie Onassis's famous sister, Lee Radzowell going out of St. Thomas More in Manhattan in a wicker basket, which sells for about $2,300 with probably maybe $4,000 of flowers on top, I don't know. Um, but light, nimble, carrying into church this new kind of vessel. 
uh, is exciting to me. And this was a great moment in New York funeral service to see that casket coming out of the door of a church. Uh, there are bamboo caskets for cremation and burial, uh, beautiful with flowers and um, biogradable, earth-friendly pine. The Jewish pine orthodox casket is biodegradable, earth-friendly, $975, uh, perfectly dignified, gorgeous with flowers. In a church, uh, you're going to have the Paul beautiful fabric over it anyway. Um, I invite you to contemplate different kinds of caskets and bring yourself to them. You can decorate caskets. You can bring um, caskets back to church again. <clears throat> Cremation has kind of taught us that um, to skip this part. It's fine to do so, but um, we talked a little bit about how nice it is to have the casket back in church. You can ask your funeral director about a rental casket. They're heavy wood, hardwood shells that look like $6,000 caskets, but inside is a cremation liner. And that, behind closed doors at the crematory, that cardboard box will slip out. And um, that's the part that's cremated. The hard shell of the big casket goes back to the funeral home to be properly cleaned and reused. So that's a, an economical uh, option if you want that impressive looking old fashioned casket with brass handles. Whether you've had a moment at the hospital, at the place of death, a church service mass prior, you can still uh, go to the crematory. Uh, much of my work is at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. They have two gorgeous chapels there, fabulously designed, beautifully decorated. Everything about the place is uplifting. Uh, people from Manhattan come to Greenwood and say, gosh, if we'd known this was so gorgeous, we would have had everything here. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're just filled with appreciation for the way it works there, and you can have committal prayers here prior to cremation. In the, uh, we don't really have open casket viewings here, and this is a family that just wanted a simple cardboard box, but we made it beautiful uh, and played music, and they decorated the box with family photographs, photocopies of the photographs, and made it their own. That was their style, and that's a way to use the crematory chapels there. Also, during COVID, when the chapels at Greenwood were closed, initially we were having committal prayers in the parking lot for about three months. It was fine, but it wasn't right, and people were depressed by the experience. So I started setting up chairs under a we weeping beech tree uh, where these branches make a kind of natural sanctuary in the body of the 425-acre cemetery. So this is a cremation committal service set up prior to cremation where we bring the casket, uh, rent chairs, uh, even serve cookies in spring water, and have a moment with the body prior to the cremation. It's on you, if you had had a church service, this would be a little unusual. This would be kind of an over-the-top thing. But uh, every family is different, and sometimes they come here first and then have a large memorial event after. So they've done the part with the physical body. You can think of your funeral as having two parts, a farewell to your physical body and then a celebration of your life. So this is the farewell to the physical body out of doors in good weather. And you can have the cremation, you could have committal prayers, and then you could bring the urn here to church, full service, eulogies, gorgeous music, march down the aisle. This is Matt Shepard's uh, service. And I love how there's uh, a pall over the, over the urn, just as there would be with a full casket. And these services are as powerful, I think, as having a full casket and a little bit easier. 
I don't want to leave you thinking that cremation is all there is. I'm a green burial advocate and very passionate about bringing burial back. There's something about burial, the opportunity to carry and process that has been lost uh, in many cremations. So if you have any allegiance or property upstate or any affiliation with New Paltz, Rhinebeck, Sleepy Hollow, there are earth-friendly cemeteries out there where grave space is, um, is much less expensive than it is here in the city. Um, we still have grave space in the five boroughs. Do not despair. You have to know where to look. Uh, you can have a full burial in the five boroughs, in your family cemetery, where everyone else is. If you're blessed to have inherited grave space, that's fantastic. You can have green burials. In, with a pine box in almost any cemetery there is. But upstate, uh, you can have a service without a casket with the deceased person. This is a little far out for some people, okay? It's, there's no casket here at all. We've shrouded the deceased person, carefully refrigerated them, kept them very cool, but then um, we honor them. Uh, by carrying them on these caissons. This uh, cemetery is the one at uh, Rhinebeck. And they have an old-fashioned caisson where you can put the casket or the deceased uh, person's body on a burial board surrounded by flowers, wrapped in fabric. Uh, and uh, these graves are only, um, I think it's $1,500 for the grave and 1,100 to open it, which is quite a bit different from uh, the five boroughs rates. Um, these are lovely experiences, but they have to make sense to you. It has to make sense to have the final resting place a little bit uh, upstate. Uh, there's a very lovely eco-friendly cemetery outside uh, Cape May, New Jersey. This one is Sleepy Hollow. They were very early to embrace earth-friendly burial. And if you look carefully, here's a a beautiful grandmother on a willow tray uh, wrapped in um, embroidered silk and surrounded by flowers. And there's something so great about the weather. The weather becomes a guest uh, at the funeral. And um, in all seasons, these, the, the fact that people are standing at a grave, resilient, you know, with energy to say farewell, um, it's just a lovely gesture and these are gorgeous ceremonies, and during the coronavirus period where all indoor spaces were closed, we were having fantastic experiences in our masks, socially distanced as best as possible uh, at these, at these uh, cemeteries, allowing this kind of earth-friendly burial. That's a willow casket on the caisson. That's the full willow. Uh, and this is a, a shrouded burial where you don't even see the shrouded gentleman because he's so covered in beautiful seasonal flowers that the family brought in their own arms. You have to get your head around this a little bit, but some of these cemeteries are trying to preserve rural property and habitat by putting deceased people under it. Once you have a, a rural cemetery like that, it'll never be a shopping mall or an apartment complex. Um, so these green spaces uh, are great. and. Uh, something about the bird song and any kind of burial in the out of doors, even if it's of an urn, and they have urn spaces at these places too, is very magical. Interesting to note that uh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust is not in the Bible. Um, it's in the Book of Common Prayer. This is the, the, the quote from Genesis, is by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is a wool casket, felted wool, biodegradable. It's British, uh, comes in brown and white. It's a nice thing. This is at Woodlawn in the Bronx. And these flowers, by the way, this was a coronavirus burial. No family in attendance. I set up a tripod and filmed the burial, streamed it from the grave. Uh, and. This was in uh, April, I'm losing my mic. This was in April of 2020, and all of the flower stores were closed. So I put out a notice in my Brooklyn neighborhood um, 
hi guys, you know, I'm a funeral director. I have a funeral on Thursday. It was the peak of lilac season. So all my neighbors cut lilacs from their yard and brought them to my stoop. And we put them on top of the casket at the grave for the family. Family music, if one of the questions I sometimes ask family members is, does anyone in the family sing? Does anyone play the violin? Incorporating family music, um, live music is a very beautiful thing at any kind of service. Um, and um, uh, it's not a performance, it's always an offering. So the, the lessons, um, winding up here a little bit because I want to have time for your questions. The lessons of the coronavirus period, for me, uh, were that the funeral is no longer one event. It's a sequence of experiences. We were even um, delivering urns to people's apartments and uh, appearing at the front door. And I tried very hard to make that a, a spiritual moment with prayers, with language at the kitchen table as I brought the urn into the house. You know. Um, the moment at the bed. If you go onto my website, you'll see we've divided the end of life period into nine different moments for different language. And of course, the Episcopal prayers are uh, lined up the same way. Prayers prior to death, at death, everything is all outlined for you in the most gorgeous way. So we were really um, moved by how the funeral is more than one event and to think of even the anniversary of the death as an event. Um, and to, in your own end of life wishes, help your family align with that idea and see how you could sequence things, have something in the summer when everyone can get together. Uh, cremation allows that kind of flexibility, but um, to think of death that way. Um, and. Um, more and more families want to be involved. They're saying to funeral directors, we want to have a role. Sometimes the daughter of a deceased woman will say to me, could I come in a little early and just check mom's makeup? Or could I be involved uh, in the arrangement uh, in some way? Or, or can we do the flowers ourselves? Baby boom families really want to have a role. And that old fashioned idea of bringing everything to a funeral firm and having um, them take care of it all for you has deprived us of a kind of um, active grieving. Uh, we do grieve better. Uh, therapists say, you know, the more involvement, the more you can walk out of the funeral saying, damn, you know, we did a good job with that. You know, I felt like I, I stood up the whole way. There are even um, at the crematory, you can, this is uh, a pretty intense experience. But at Greenwood, the crematory retorts are designed in such a way that they're so, it's an impressive space. And you can actually witness the casket's entry into the retort. Uh, this is more popular uh, uh, with Buddhists and Hindu families who want to be present for that moment. But uh, more and more people are requesting for that kind of opportunity too, that kind of involvement that witnessing, that feeling of we took it as far as we could go. And that the fact that there were fewer options during COVID, that spaces were closed, allowed us to come up with some really good ideas. The decision to bury or cremate relies on one's religious beliefs, family traditions, perception of self, and size of the pocketbook. So sitting down with a funeral director and exploring, you know, every time you walk down the street, notice how a lot of funeral firms have four different directors hanging their license at the door. Go in ahead of time before you need them and ask for the priceless. Befriend death by befriending funeral homes in the New York City area. I think you'll meet a lot of nice people and be surprised. Is my sound okay? It is, but if you want to use the handheld mic, feel free. OK. Um, I have a lot of advice. A lot of the things we've spoken uh, about today are on my blog, The Inspired Funeral. Uh, and this is me in Brooklyn. Um, that's my email. Well, I'll take your questions now and um, put a gift to be here and be speaking to you.
it's really wonderful to have you yeah. here, Amy. Thank you for walking us that's, through all of that so quickly. kind of a crash course. That was, <laughs> that was a jogger's tour, okay? Um, each one of these, I have presentations on the history of cremation, uh, how to write a condolence letter, you know, green burial alone, and how to improve cremation. But I condensed everything today for you. So I know that's a lot. But thank you. And we appreciate it. We, we only have a few minutes for questions, so I encourage you, you can use the live chat function on YouTube, the comments function on Facebook. You can email me, pthompson at stbarts.org. That's P-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N at stbarts.org. And then if you're here in person, there's some comments car cards on the, the table. And if you can just put it on the central table, I'll make sure to, to have your uh, questions answered. Uh, a few things I just wanted to add to, yes, to what you said um, before we address those questions. One is that, as you did mention, Amy, we have resources within the Episcopal tradition for prayers with the body, both before the time of death and then between the time of death and the funeral. Most folks aren't aware of that, so there is a kind of cultural knowledge of last rites, especially for those who have some Roman Catholic background. Um, but we have a liturgy that's called ministration at the time of death, and that can be said right before death or right at, at death. And you should feel free with you and your loved ones to, um, uh, to ask us to be there. There are also prayers for a vigil with the body. So that is an option within our tradition. There are Episcopal liturgies for that, so we can be there to do that. Um, we have a... Uh, uh, a funeral planning form that is, we have a meeting about it on Tuesday, it's just about to be finalized and will be on the website by June so that you will be able to go online and fill out your funeral planning form so that we have it on file. So we'll, also, we'll also get some of the pamphlets that Amy's mentioned so, so you have some additional resources to look at. Um, I can tell you that it's always easier to plan the funeral if you've given us some instructions in advance because there are always questions for the family. What music, what readings, who do you want to speak, etc. The more you can tell us before that moment happens, the more you can talk with your loved one about what they want, the more helpful it yes. is to us. Name your hymns, right? Absolutely. Name the color of your flowers. Uh, some people want videos when they're alive and well, messages to the family. Some folks write letters to their loved ones in advance, sealed for the time of their wedding, you know, in the future for them to open these envelopes. They're people who plan so thoroughly um, so that um, uh, death is not as much as of a surprise. It's um, inevitable, and the more we um, share our wishes with our family members, the better. And the final thing I wanted to mention, and Jama Tung, our Director of Stewardship and Development, I promised her I would say this, um, as part of planning for your death, um, think about what kind of legacy you want to live, and we would love if St. Bart's is part of that legacy. We're about to celebrate the Mosaic Society uh, in early June, uh, which is our planned giving group. Um, so as you're making these decisions about um, your end of life care and how you want to be celebrated, think also about the legacy you're going to live and hopefully St. Bart's will be a part of that. Uh, okay, so I'll try to fit in at least these two questions. How do you choose a funeral home in New York City? Boy, um, I think the more you walk around and walk into the door and feel um, the energy of the particular space, the better off you'll be. So make it sort of a way of getting to know the city better um, to get no, to know the funeral firms. Uh, I will say that um, prices uh, range rather dramatically. And um, uh, I don't want to say too much more than that. I don't want to sound like a salesperson. Uh, but um, you will know when you walk through the door and meet uh, even informally with the people in the hallways, and that price list, by law, is supposed to be right there for you to take. And all you have to do is walk in and say, I need a price list, and you don't need to explain, but just do your research that there. And uh, I wish New York Magazine, I've written them, New York Magazine could do a fabulous cover story on the richness and insanity of the New York City funeral home um, and the way... Um, uh, different tribes of the city uh, align with the funeral directors. The fire department has its favorites, and the Jewish community, obviously, African American, it's been uh, a very segregated uh, system. And um, 
I will say that African American funeral directors have a completely different history and a role as civil rights leaders and uh, venue space providers. And there's a trust and dignity to funeral service in the African American community that was at least temporarily lost in, in other um, kinds of firms. So it's, it's a very rich, there's so many books as part of your spiritual practice to read the f history of the American funeral business is a very nice uh, thing to do. You will be um, uh, enriched by the history from the Civil War onwards. Um, so I encourage you to do that and live in a way so that you're reading poetry thinking, would that be good at my funeral? Or I sit in the car driving, listening to music. People ask me, how is your life different since becoming a funeral director? My response has become, I hear music differently. And people think, that's a strange thing to say. I thought you were going to say you were less fearful of death or something. But um, <laughs> your um, own uh, audio system uh, is uh, sort of sensitized by uh, thinking of music uh, and its end of life um, potential. Can you talk a, just a little bit about how you work as a funeral director without a funeral home? Oh, well, um, when uh, someone uh, starts a firm, an LLC, uh, because real estate is so expensive here and funeral homes by law are required to have chapels of a certain dimension and prep rooms that are formaldehyde ready, even if you are not embalming, we didn't talk about embalming, but even um, if you're uh, avoiding embalming and don't need it as much, um, you have to have a lawful place of residence. So I hang my legal registration uh, at a Jewish firm in Brooklyn, and we are very good partners uh, because uh, they support me. I work with men 40 years in the business. I'm so humble. I've been at it 10 years now uh, and, um, and teaching a, a, a slew of younger women coming into this work, very passionate about it. But I'm so grateful that I came in at a time where I still had um, exposure to the old time guys who are so marvelous and, and, and so deep and have seen so many amazing things. So the stories are uh, remarkable. And, and um, I feel very blessed to have gotten into this when I did. Final question, what, are there rules or laws about scattering ashes? There are um, recommendations. And um, you, there was a gentleman we discussed before we started who uh, was found sprinkling cremated remain in the orchestra pit of the Metropolitan Opera. <laughs> it was in the New York Times about seven years ago. This poor gentleman was arrested, taken into the station, and cried, saying, I was just doing what my friend told me he wanted. But they thought it was anthrax. Um, so they shut the opera down at intermission. The show did not go on. That was embarrassing. So you don't want to do that. The, the Coast Guard asks that you go three miles out to scatter cremated remain in New York City. Uh, people scatter in Central Park. I think, just think, take it slow. Don't make any hasty decisions. Uh, scattering in the woods is lovely, but you want to be sure that you can go back to the place and remember the person. So I'm kind of keen on the final resting place. The, when cremation uh, was a, after the Civil War, when it began to be discussed as an option in, in the United States, there was a memorial idea, and um, uh, your columbarium here abides by it, that the remains should be in a, in a place of permanence and in a container that will hold them pretty much forever. So I just encourage people to move slowly and, and not feel like they need to get rid of them right away. Uh, I also you know, some people who can't make up their minds, that box from the crematory ends up in the hall closet with the gloves and the hats above the winter coats, and I, I'm not keen on that either. Um, so get advice, talk to others, uh, figure out a good solution and an affordable one, and uh, your funeral director should help you with that. I've, and, your, I've, and your pastor. I've seen that closet thing a lot, and it yes. can get in the way of uh, kind of a necessary ritual of goodbye. Yes. 
And it's supposed to be bad feng shui. <laughs> <laughs> the oriental uh, interior design method doesn't advocate holding that loss, those ashes that remain too close to living things. Well, Amy, unfortunately, we have to stop. I think there's, so there great. are plenty of other things we could talk about. We Absolutely. really appreciate you being here. Thank, thank you all for being here as well. Yes, thank you, Amy. Thank you. Um, thank you. We hope you'll join us for our worship in just a few moments at 11 a.m. The forum is off next week because it is Mother's Day and this space is being used for Mother's Day brunch. So we're taking one more week off and then we'll be back two weeks from today on May 15th and our very own Dr. Paolo Bordignon will be the guest to talk about our great organ, the largest organ in New York City ahead of a gala organ concert later this month sponsored by the Conservancy. So we hope you'll join us then and we'll, we hope you'll join us for worship in just a few minutes at 11. Take Thank care. you, everyone. Thank you.